we've had wonderful speakers, and I've never met Rick Stadler, but um, I think I know him a little bit now uh, in, in preparing my introductory remarks. Rick Statler, it seems to me, is eminently prepared on at least two levels to talk with this organization. Um, and I'll, I'll read his professional qualifications. Uh, Rick Statler followed an interesting road leading to his current position as director of printed and manuscript Americana at Swan Galleries. He developed his interest in history as an undergraduate at Brown University, and he completed his master's degree in history at Rhode Island College. Following graduate school, he became manuscript curator and library director at the Rhode Island Historical Society and then archivist at the Houghton Library. While at Harvard, he honed his cataloging and research skills by examining paper and printed material collections um, that were as wide and as eclectic as you can imagine. When I was reading about the stuff you worked with, you know, Civil War letters to you know, the papers of the indomitable, indomitable uh, Samuel Johnson. You know, that was a pretty impressive and, and wide area uh, of inquiry. At Swan, he puts his research and cataloging skills to work in acquiring and preparing the sale of anything related to the history of the Americas from 1492 to the present. And um, I, I think he has the perfect job <laughs> because, you know, recently Swan auctioned a seventh edition of the Baysam book. And I'm assuming you held that thing and spent some time looking at it. Um, so it, it, imagine the stuff that comes across this guy's desk. You know, it's, it's the stuff of, of, of legend, I guess. But there's another level that qualifies Rick to be a speaker today. Um, in June of 1870, I think it was June 10th, in, of 1870, there was a, a historic baseball game that was contested at Capital Line Field in Brooklyn. Um, the Atlantic Baseball Club of Brooklyn defeated the mighty Cincinnati Red Stockings. Um, if you were at this gathering last year, you heard someone talk about 19th century baseball ephemera. And the Cincinnati Red Stockings were the first juggernaut of baseball. And in 1869, they went undefeated. And one of the teams they beat was the Atlantics of Brooklyn. And the Atlantics of Brooklyn did not take that defeat um, with any real grace um, because they couldn't wait to play the, uh, the Red Stockings the next year. And of course, they won. And it was shortly after that that the, the Red Stockings uh, were disbanded. Um, Rick plays 19th century baseball under the 1864 New York uh, rules, correct? Um, and he plays for the Atlantics. No. And all sorts of ephemera was generated in the 19th century, as, as many of you know, that related to baseball. And there's a very famous picture, uh, it's a trade card, of the 1865 Atlantics that uh, about four years ago sold at auction for I think it's something like ninety-two or $93,000. Um, so we have living ephemera <laughs> with us today in the case of Rick Statler. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce him to you and I know you will enjoy his remarks about almanacs. Rick. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, if I start talking about baseball, this is going to go off the rails really quickly. Um, I've, uh, this is my first visit to the Ephemera Society, and I've, I've really enjoyed seeing all of the, the beautiful, colorful ephemera up on the screen. Uh, it, it's, it's been an aesthetic delight. I'm sorry to report those days are over. Um, we're moving into the 18th century. We have um, three colors. We have black, white, and various shades of brown. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for the absence of color here, but I hope the content will make up for that. Almanacs were one of the most popular literary genres in colonial America. Farmers bought them every year to get an accurate uh, account of the natural cycles of the earth, 
sunrise, sunset, the tides, um, even the weather. Uh, publishers eventually included other kinds of information in there to make them more attractive to, uh, to purchasers, but they're really basically apolitical utilitarian documents. And when the colonies started to come in conflict with the mother country, many of the almanac makers used their platform to begin pushing this patriotic agenda. And this important flow of revolutionary text and iconography is often forgotten about today. While the role of newspapers and broadsides and pamphlets, it still makes sense to our modern sensibilities, the almanac uh, seems sort of quaint and archaic. Uh, has anyone spent time with, with the modern uh, old farm farmer's almanac? Uh, it, it, it's uh, sort of more of a curiosity than an essential part of your daily life. And, and you can't really imagine it um, playing a role in creating a revolution. But that's, that's what we're, uh, we're going to look at here. I'm going to start off uh, just with some broad outlines of the genre and then examine how they uh, helped stir up the anti-British fervor after, uh, between the Stamp Act and the onset of the war. Uh, we'll look at how the tone shifted once we're actually at war. And then I'll draw some conclusions about um, I'll in part extrapolate from uh, the fortunes of alma almanacs on the auction market uh, just to, to look at this in a, a different perspective. All right, the almanac genre, um, we're talking about one of the first products of the American press. Uh, when Stephen Day set up his Cambridge printing press, first thing he put out was the Oath of a Freeman. Next thing he put out was not the Bay Psalm book, it was a single sheet almanac in 1639. There are no, uh, no known copies surviving. Uh, the, the genre was brought over from England. It was, it was already popular there, and it evolved here in parallel with English almanacs. Uh, and, and they spread across the colonies pretty much uh, simultaneously with the spread of printing presses. Many, print, uh, many printers would issue them reliably every year as, as a, uh, a staple of their, uh, their catalog. Colonial American farmers did not generally have clocks or calendars or weather reports. They didn't have television, unfortunately. Um, almanacs filled some of these essential functions. Can everyone hear me all right, by the way? Excellent. Um, there are some features which are common to almost all almanacs. Here's an example from Boston in 1778. We have um, uh, the calendar page. Uh, you'll, you'll have a page for each month, and we have the uh, the uh, cycles of the moon and the sunrise and the sunset, uh, weather predictions a year in advance, which is better than we have today. <laughs> and we also have key dates. Uh, this particular calendar, for example, this is put out in Boston. And here on the 15th of July, we have commencement at Cambridge. That's at Harvard. That's something that probably anyone in the Boston area would be uh, interested in knowing about. And then up here on July 4th, we are just uh, 18 months after the, rev uh, after the uh, Declaration of Independence, and we already have it commemorated here on the calendar, American Independence, 1776. Um, here's another thing you'll see in, in many of these early almanacs. Uh, this is Anatomy of Man's Body as covered by the 12 constellations, sometimes known as just the Zodiac Man. It ties in with the astronomical predictions, the weather predictions that you see on the previous page. I hope to explain many things to you today. I'm not even going to try on this one. This is just bizarre. But you'll see this all the time. And the first time you see it, you're, you're fascinated, and then you just get baffled. So we're just going to move on. It's probably for the best. <laughs> Here we have a um, uh, table of distances at the top of, oops, at the uh, at the top of the uh, the, the page um, between different towns. Just utilitarian information that they they put in towards the rear of the almanac. Um, we have um, uh, a little advertisement from the, from the printer. Some of these have court dates, other tidbits of information. Almanacs were used in the house all year long. Um, it, there's sort of a, a spectrum between newspapers and books. You have um, a book which you might buy read once, put on your shelf, refer to it occasionally for the rest of your life, and put it in your estate inventory. On the other hand, you have newspapers, which are um, you know, perhaps read once, used to wrap your fish with or, or uh, uh, feed your fire. Almanacs are sort of in between that. They're, they're put out once a year. 
but they are used. They're kept in the house all year long. People are referring to them. Um, uh, this is, this is a, a volume of almanacs that was actually kept by one family from 1744 to 1801, um, just kept together in a crudely bound uh, wad of almanacs. These almanacs had mass distribution. They, uh, the Ames Almanac in Boston sold about 50,000 copies per year. Poor Richard in Philadelphia was around 10,000 a year. This is a far wider distribution than even the most popular newspapers of this time. Um, the, the, the more popular ones were typically around 2,500 a day. Several of the major almanacs published straight through the war continuously every year. As I understand it, not a single newspaper published without interruption throughout the entire war. And these almanacs were reaching a rural agricultural audience that to some extent might have missed out on the newspapers and on the barrage of political pamphlets that were coming out. Marion Barber Stoll is one of the few authors who has really written on almanacs in the revolution. And, and I'll, I'll give you a quote from her. We tend to forget the 18th century farmer's constant dependence upon his almanac. He trusted it. He consulted it daily, hanging by the fireplace, usually open to a single page for a month at a time. It's possible that the embattled farmer was imbued with much of his fighting spirit from this daily perusal of the almanac. He read the same kind of argument that his city cousins were reading in the pamphlets and the newspapers. This is just a summary by, uh, by state of where the almanacs were being printed during the period of the revolution. Um, as you can see, they're printed almost throughout the, uh, the original 13 states. Uh, North Carolina didn't manage to get one out, but other than that, we have the South, the North, uh, New England, New York. Uh, pretty much follows the uh, extent of printing in colonial America. 77% uh, of them are from the, the, the top four states. Um, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York. That's where most of the printing was being done, and that's, that's where most of the almanacs were coming out of as well. But they're, they're really coming from across the young nation. A very large percentage of colonial printers produced almanacs, and a, a fairly large percentage of colonial engravers did at least occasional work on these almanacs for these printers. And printers and, and engravers were, to a large extent, the media of their day, and they're instrumental in creating popular support for the revolution. So it's unsurprising that many of the notable patriots came from a background in almanac production. And I'll give you a, a quick quiz if we can name a uh, founding father who was involved in almanac production. Ben Franklin, there we go. That's, uh, that's an easy one. Ben Franklin, he came from a printing family, which means he came from an almanac family. His father, his mother, his brother, and his nephew all produced almanacs, as well as Ben. He launched the Poor Richard's Almanac in 1733, continued producing them through 1758, and then he continued printing them in a business partner partnership through 1766 as Franklin and Hall. Uh, the aphorisms that he would insert into these, they, they've been probably the most enduring production um, from the almanac genre. But he was already moving on to other projects by the time of the Stamp Act. So his almanacs are actually not the most incendiary in a, in a political sense, um, because by the time he was shifting out of that, he was moving on to other things. Can anyone give us another sort of A-list patriot who every schoolboy knows who was actually involved in almanac production? Oh, he's pretty good. He's a, he's a favorite. We'll get to him later. Um, Paul Revere. Paul Revere, uh, certainly not his main line, but Paul Revere was an engraver in Boston and uh, did uh, fairly uh, frequent work for, for almanacs doing engravings. Um, this is uh, a, a dwarf named Emma Leach from a 1771 almanac that he did. Um, he, he, he did woodcuts for Boston Almanacs pretty much uh, uh, through the 18, uh, 1760s and 1770s. He never signed them, uh, but we, we know that he did them because his, his account book survived and he, he charged the publishers. Um, here's another one that he did. Uh, this is an eclipse from an almanac from 1765. This is definitely not high art and it's not really topical, but they give, it, give us a link between the almanac world and the spark of the revolution. 
resistance to British rule and British taxation was controversial in the colonies. And uh, as people tried to pick sides, um, some of the printers were trying to remain apolitical in their almanacs, hoping to sell to both camps. And then there were others who were very vocal patriots and, and, and targeted their almanacs at that audience. This is Benjamin West's almanac from Providence, Rhode Island, put out in 1766. And his introduction celebrates the repeal of the Stamp Act, which, quote, so lately hung over our heads like a heavy cloud, an act in its nature detestable, plotted and contrived by a set of wicked designing men, and had it taken its place among us, it would have enslaved millions of loyal subjects and subverted the whole constitution of English America. This politicization, it manifested itself in different ways in different parts of the colonies. Uh, Boston and, and the rest of New England, they were the hotbed of resistance, and so the almanacs generally reflected that. But then you get to Philadelphia, on the other hand, and uh, it was much more conservative. Um, poor Richard's almanac, even, even though Franklin was involved, they, they denounced the Stamp Act a couple of times in, in um, the early years, but they pretty much turned apolitical after 1766 and, and kept a low profile. Um, his competitor, William Bradford, put out an almanac. Uh, every year on the calendar, they'd mention the repeal of the Stamp Act, which is a little uh, uh, token for the, uh, for the patriots. But he also continued to celebrate the birthdays of the royal family, so he's trying to play to both camps there. Uh, sometimes you'd see patriotism, which was probably more calculated than sincere. There was an almanac maker named uh, Margaret Draper, who was a loyalist. Um, uh, she produced very patriotic almanacs in Boston. She knew her market, um, but eventually during the war, she actually moved to London. Uh, on the other hand, you had uh, some printers who, who were out front about, uh, about um, supporting the royal cause. This, this is from a New York printer named Hugh Gain always known for, for, for trying to, to uh, walk on the fence between the two camps. Um, this 1774 almanac is, is pretty clearly intended for the Loyalist contingent, lists all of the past British colonial governors of New York, the staff of the British Army in America, the British ships of war. This is th pretty close to, uh, to the opening of hostilities here. Um, even the names of the royal administrators for each colony. And when the British later took over New York and stayed there for the duration of the war. Gaines stayed behind in New York and kept publishing as, as an outright loyalist, although he hedged his bets enough so that he, he was able to, uh, to stay in New York after that. Uh, the almanacs, were, which were published in the fall of 1774, just before the eve of the fighting, they had some of the most dramatic content, uh, particularly in Boston. This one by Nathaniel Lowe has a woodcut um, titled The Virtuous Patriot at the Hour of Death on the title page. And we have the, uh, the, 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 the caption below, if prayers and tears the patriot's life could save, none but the usurping villain's death would have, or have. The rhymes don't work so well anymore, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but uh, thumbing through the almanac, it's not just the cover. Uh, we have a, a, a four-page address to the inhabitants of Boston which warns that the heavy hand of power under which you are now groaning is designed only as a prelude to the utter abolishment of American freedom. Almanacs were produced annually each fall. So, so that last one, it was produced in the fall of 1774. Tensions were high. Uh, the fighting might have seemed inevitable, but it hadn't actually started yet. And, and by the time the next almanacs were produced in the fall of 1775, you have a much different mood in the country. Uh, plenty of blood has already been shed at Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill. Uh, Boston's already occupied by the British in a state of siege. Almost every man in the colonies had already taken sides. So the time for persuasion had passed and the almanacs uh, to some extent moved on to the, uh, the uh, inspiration of, of the troops to chronicling what has, what has uh, transpired. Um, Here's a, here's a neat one from uh, produced in the fall of 1775 uh, in New London, Connecticut by Nathan Dable. Uh, this is a woodcut, which is a, a crude copy of an earlier engraving, The Able Doctor or America Swallowing the Bitter Draft. And, and we have the caption, um, 
within Boston cannonaded. And this image, uh, some of you might know the original source image for this. We have both of them here. This is um, the original from uh, the London Magazine in, in the May, May of 1774, sympathetic to the American cause. Um, we've got an Indian woman who represents America. She's having, uh, she's being attacked by four British ministers. Uh, they're forcibly pouring tea, which represents the intolerable acts down her throat. One of them is looking under her skirt. Um, we have uh, Britannia is, is weeping in shame, um, standing behind them. So it's uh, uh, definitely a, a pro-American or anti-British uh, um, anti policy uh, cartoon. And this is something that uh, a Connecticut farmer might not have had ready access to. They might not have been subscribing to the London magazines. But you could buy your almanac, and, and in order to get your, your sunrise and sunset and, and um, uh, weather information, you're also getting this on the cover in a, in a cheaper and, and somewhat cruder form. Here's a, a 1777 almanac uh, featuring a full page map of New York City, of the New York City area. We have Manhattan in the middle. We have uh, Staten Island down in the lower, uh, lower right and Long Island on the um, lower left. And uh, you can see from the key, they actually show where um, General Washington's lines on New York Island are, right in the middle of Manhattan there with the big letter A. So they're, they're, they're giving us some current events there. And perhaps by the time you actually got this almanac into your hands, you can't rely on this to be current anymore, but it's, it's giving people an impression of, of the, the front lines. Here's a, uh, a very long address from Nathaniel Lowe's 1776 almanac, uh, put out in the fall of 75. This is an address to the soldiers of the American Army. Um, you can all read along with me, I'm sure, if your eyes are much, much better than mine. Um, but I'll, I'll read you a snippet. It's a, a really stirring bit of rhetoric, and as far as I can tell, it's original to this almanac, and it has apparently never been published elsewhere, um, which, which somewhat surprises me that, that, that something like this can still come out and, and be fresh. If any of you have heard this before as I say it, um, please stop me, and, and you can, you can um, chant along with me if you wish. Um, we are reduced to the sad alternative of defending the most sacred and inestimable of all our enjoyments from utter ruin, or yield them to the will of a banditti of tyrants more implacable than the savages of the wilderness. We shall defend those rights and privileges without which life itself is a burden in the risk of our lives in the high places of the field. You are not enlisted under the banners of a tyrant to fight in the cause of slavery for the sake of a little paltry cash, no, you are freemen and have something besides the reward of a hireling to fight for. You have your houses, your lands, your wives, your children, your liberty, your country to defend. Who knew? It, it, it's, uh, it, 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 the, the whole thing is in that vein and uh, a, a very nice uh, piece of patriotic rhetoric, which, which uh, I, I stumbled across in the course of putting together this presentation. Uh, here's the title page from another almanac from, from the same year, uh, Stearns' New, uh, New England Almanac for uh, 1776 from Worcester. And this one has an account of the commencement of hostilities, including an eyewitness account of the Battle of Lexington. Uh, Rob Sagendorf, who wrote a, uh, an important book on almanacs, called it the most striking example of this kind of on-the-spot reporting. Also, for practical advice, we're not just doing reporting here. Um, instead of uh, just you know how to prepare a, a, a poultice or, or uh, predict your fortunes from the moon, we have a piece called Directions for Preserving the Health of Soldiers in the Camps. Here's a, a Bickerstaff Almanac from 1776. Uh, this features a military plan of Boston, as you can see. Uh, we've got the batteries and, and the forts and Bunker Hill. Um, the, the key shows it all. It's very timely information, and you know, as, as you know, the, uh, the city was under siege at that point. Um, that wasn't moving all that quickly, so it's probably relevant information by the time people received their almanac. Um, but on a more, much more practical level, just like the other guy was telling us how to preserve the health of soldiers in the camp, Bickerstaff has uh, detailed instructions for making gunpowder at home. 
And we don't know for sure that anyone followed his instructions, uh, made some gunpowder in their, in their backyard, and, and actually used it to, uh, to fire at British troops. But it would be hard to prove they didn't either. Um, and these, these things, like I said, had pretty wide distribution. So I, I, I suspect somebody at least tried it. And I hope they were not harmed. Almanacs also functioned as diaries very often. You may have seen this phenomenon before. Um, in the earliest period, people would, would uh, write in the margins of the almanacs. They'd uh, put little notations right here on the side, you know, saying, uh, bought a calf or uh, somebody came to board with us, uh, just little jottings. Uh, eventually, they started uh, interleaving pieces of blank paper facing each month. So we'd have a, a, a sort of monthly, very, very brief diary. And this one was kept in Boston in 1778. We don't know who actually wrote the, uh, the diary, but this is an example of, of, of it being used as a memorandum book. We have, um, uh, this one has a note on General Bourgoin uh, dining in Boston with General Heath. On the 5th, he set off from Cambridge for Rhode Island in order to embark for Great Britain on parole. This is a British general who was captured and being sent back to England. And then we have here on the 22nd, um, which was observed as a day of fasting and prayer throughout the United States of America. We have another page from the same almanac where we have the Battle of Rhode Island. And then on the 30th, our army retreated in good order from Rhode Island and brought off all their artillery, baggage, etc. So putting a positive spin on a rough day. Oh, and we also have a visit from the Marquis de Lafayette here. So we've, we've got lots of uh, good Revolutionary War content, um, even, even um, you know, facing a, um, a calendar page which, which doesn't have anything that might jump out at you. Um, portraiture is another interesting feature of some of these Revolutionary War almanacs. The men and women who were supporting the Revolution were intensely curious about what these guys looked at, looked like. Um, these, th th our new leaders, We've chosen to trust our future with them, uh, but few of these uh, uh, of the of the almanac buying public had ever seen these people. You know, unless you'd actually been in the military, you, you probably wouldn't have actually seen Washington. There's no television, no photography. Uh, daily newspapers had om almost no illustrations. Magazines were few and far between and very expensive, as were uh, single sheet engravings. Almanacs with a longer production schedule, they sometimes tried to fill this void by offering portraits of our new leaders. Does anyone recognize these handsome fellows on the right? <laughs> these are our new leaders. Um, your, your son's uh, gone off to fight with the glorious Washington and Gates, and you're trying to picture your son might have uh, sent home a letter from the front um, explaining um, what, a, what a great man Washington was and how we have to uh, trust in his leadership um, but you don't know what the man looks like. Now we know. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is George Washington and Horatio Gates. Uh, the evolution of Washington portraiture is sort of an interesting subject. Um, as far as I know, the first portrait ever painted of him was in 1772, but it, it was just that. It was a painting it hung in, on a wall. Um, it had never actually been engraved until 17. 78, which is after this was put out, um, there was a, an engraving of Washington that had appeared in London. They wanted to know who their enemy was. So they completely um, issued a fictitious portrait in London, uh, made uh, attributed to a painter who never existed and looks nothing like Washington. But that Washington in England was actually a pretty handsome fellow. Um, our Washington was a homely man of the people, I guess. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, this copy, the foxing has completely obscured his eyes. But that's what we have. Um, I have uh, Horatio Gates, who you probably don't know his face as well, but he was a distinguished veteran of the British Army who'd, who, who was serving with the Americans. And I don't see even a faint resemblance. It's possible that the, the, the artist might have seen these guys uh, from a, across a field or, or parading through, um, through the streets, but I'm, I'm guessing that these are completely fictitious as well. Here's another portrait of General Joseph Warren. Um, uh, once the fighting started, uh, the Patriots all of a sudden had martyrs. And so almanacs like this help, help put a face on our new American martyrs. This is um, printed in the fall of 75, not 
um, not many months after Bunker Hill. And so we have General Warren who, who fell at the battle and a poem to his memory. Let's view brave Warren in yon azure skies. May every mind with this loved object rise. No more our orator exerts his breath seized by the cruel messenger of death. What can his dear Americans return but drop a tear upon his happy urn? Thou tomb shalt safe retain thy sacred trust till life divine reanimate his dust. Here's another um, early patriot Americans were probably curious about, Ethan Allen. It was on the cover of this almanac from, from Danvers, Massachusetts. Um, it's advertising a, um, uh, they're actually printing Ethan Allen's memoirs of his recent captivity by the British. And we have a portrait who, uh, which we assume to be Allen here on the cover. So it's not a furniture? No, no, it's not a furniture. <laughs> Um, as the war stretched on to its um, fourth and fifth and sixth years, almanacs started to have less political content. Um, in parallel to the pamphlet wars, you know, we're, we're not really arguing about whether we're going to really do this crazy thing. We are doing it, and, and so we don't need as much inspiration. Um, after Yorktown, the bulk of the fighting is over. Um, at, at this point, uh, fall of, of 1780, we're, we're, we're still in the thick of it, but um, going through some of these later almanacs, you really have to pick through and, and uh, look for hints that we're actually at war. This one, there's a, a brief history of the Allegheny philosopher, and they, uh, he features predictions on various things, including the, the, the fate of the war. Sort of in passing, there's a, a reference to the revolution in a long quotation from Shakespeare. Um, but we, you really have to have to dig deeper with some of these almanacs. They don't really start to get heated again until the debates on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, which is really a whole separate topic. I just like this one. This is um, a Weatherwise Almanac from 1789 uh, with one of the very few contemporary uh, depictions of New York's Federal Hall, um, where the first Congress met, where the Constitution and the Bill of Rights were adopted, where Washington was inaugurated. And we've got a, uh, a nice poem in there, too. Um, each of the uh, calendar pages is headed with a short poem on one of the American generals, too. Uh, General Washington, immortal, chief, illustrious sage, his godlike worth from age to age shall spread to every clime. So we start to get this um, uh, deep patriotism as we're really forging out the boundaries of, of this new nation. So we'll move on to some conclusions here. Um, these almanacs seem very rich in content, but they're, I, I think they've been underappreciated by scholars and by collectors. I probably shouldn't speak to the academics on this one. My, my academic achievements are modest. Um, but I have found surprisingly little discussion in the academic literature on this. I have copies of a, a little bibliography if anyone wants to grab one afterwards. But I'm, a, I'm an auction specialist, not an academic, so I can offer some systematic data on what the market thinks on this subject. Uh, I should probably just take a quick poll just to get a, an impression of what my audience is, having never been to the Ephemera Society before. How many of you are collectors? Okay, good, good, good. Um, there can be some overlap, too. How many are librarians and archivists? Okay, excellent. Um, how many are... Um, in the book trade, uh, auction uh, dealers, okay, a few. And how many are academics? Handful, okay, so I don't have to worry too much here. Um, <laughs> how many of us have written books on almanacs? <laughs> just, just, just the one, okay, excellent. If there were more than one, I'd be a little nervous here. Um, in general, anything relating to the American Revolution does extremely well on the market. That shouldn't really be a, a, um, a radical statement. I won't say it's hot, because it's always been hot for as long as people have been collecting Americana. Uh, Rev War material has always been scarce and desirable, but of course, some material is more desirable than others. Manuscripts do very well, uh, for example. Um, the auction record for a Revolutionary War era letter is $300,000, as far as I could tell, for a George Washington letter. Um, what he wrote upon leaving the army. Broadsides, of course, are, are always very collectible. Holy Grail is the, the Dunlap broadside of the Declaration. Uh, one of them sold for $2.2 million. 
some of the pamphlets from the revolution do very well. Uh, Payne's Common Sense has gotten up to 450,000. And newspapers um, can get um, well into six figures as well uh, for the Declaration of Independence printings and, and such. But then we get into almanacs, and we have uh, much more modest results here. We have poor Richard's almanac from 1776. Like I said, Ben Franklin um, put that out. It's got Franklin's name on it, but it's really only being sold for as a Franklin imprint. So it's not really revolutionary. It's from that period. But that brought $11,000 for the, for the best uh, example I could find from, from this period. Um, the next highest was an almanac from 1778, which you would think would do it, and that brought $8,000. But that actually had a diary in it. And it wasn't just any diary. It was a diary written by one of the uh, signers of the Declaration of Independence while he was serving in the Continental Congress. It was just William Ellery. Those of us from Rhode Island know he's not really one of the uh, firebrands of the revolution. But still, um, you would think that would, that would do extremely well. And that, that would be the record for an almanac from the revolutionary period. But you can't really say that's just a Revolutionary War almanac. It's a, it's a diary. Um, so the best I could actually find for being sold just as an almanac was Free Better's Almanac from 1776, which is this one here, the, uh, the able doctor administering, administering the, uh, uh, the, 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 the bitter draft. And that sold at, at Swan for $5,800, which is a few less zeros than we see up here on the top of, of the, uh, the screen. Uh, it strikes me as extremely low. And uh, you can, you can get other uh, interesting almanacs from the Revolutionary War period for around $500 or, or $1,000 sometimes, and, and, and not just through me, but through anyone who's, who's in the trade. All right. Um, I think a lot of this is because we've, we've largely forgotten how important the almanac was in the daily life of colonial America. You kind of focus on the dodgy weather predictions, the folksy sayings. Um, it's easy to overlook, overlook that these books were very important in the lives of revolutionary America. And I think these market results are a proxy for how they're regarded in the world of history, either popular or academic. They're just not viewed as important or interesting, and I believe it's, it's an oversight. There is definitely meat to chew on here still. And uh, 240 years into this crazy experiment that we call the United States of America, for me, there's, there's a certain comfort in knowing that we still have more to learn about the American Revolution. Thank you. Do we have time for a couple yes. of questions? Yes. Any questions? Yes. Could you say a few things about how almanacs were distributed? Um, that's a good question. Probably there are people here who can address that better than me. I mean, th they, they were issued by printers who were often printers slash booksellers, so, so they would be sold um, you know, at, at urban bookshops. I don't know how they would get into the countryside, whether, whether farmers were buying them on visits into the city or if they were being sold by, by smaller uh, uh, booksellers off in, the, off in the countryside. There's the man who's wrote the book on almanacs. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Yeah, and the Bible can last for, for, for 50 or 100 years, and the almanac, they, you replenish it each year. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Could you categorize who might be the customers or buyers of almanacs? Are they libraries or individual collections? Uh, today. Um, um, yeah, I, I would say um, <coughs> probably, probably more private collectors at this point. I, the, the great collections of early American imprints 
have a pretty thorough collection of these already. Um, you know, they're, they're a place like the Ameri uh, American Antiquarian Society, they have, um, I don't know what the percentage would be, but you know, certainly most of the ones that we're selling, they've got a copy and then they might have an extra copy with some, some interesting variant. Because um, these were printed in large numbers, but um, yeah, the, the private collectors are, are, are still certainly uh, finding, finding something to look at there. Yes. <laughs> I did not, and sorry. How do they compare, as we go on, thousands of people create business directories that for urban land are in some ways comparable in purpose and have some of the same information in it, postage, cost, and all of that. Is there, is there a market for them? How, how are they doing it? Well, th there's definitely a... Uh, um, to some extent, a gradual evolution between the almanacs and the city directories. Um, uh, some of these almanac makers gradually expanded their almanacs until they got up to 100 or 120 pages. Um, so, so the, uh, the 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 city directories are sort of a separate genre, but they 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 uh, have some common ancestry. And and the uh, the earliest uh, city directories from from any city um, can can do pretty well at auction, although they they. Um, uh, they, s they, they, all they also have more reference value than, than an almanac as far as uh, you know, genealogical interest and that sort of thing, too. Yes, sir. Um, uh, certainly not intentional. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, there, there, there were certainly uh, um, other almanac makers who who are doing interesting work, um, but um, in all honesty, this, the uh, the presentation was largely driven by things that I've I've uh, I've, I've handled and, and done the research on over the years, and I haven't come across a, a particularly uh, uh, interesting whole one. Sorry. Um, yes, ma'am. I, I had really hoped to find something like that, and in, in the secondary literature that I read through, I, I wasn't able to find anything uh, relating to the revolution where, where, where uh, we, we have the smoking gun of, of, the, of the almanac saving this young nation, but uh, maybe someone else has spotted something. Ah. <laughs> um, I think it's it's just a matter of, of convention. There are. Um, uh, I promised at the beginning I wasn't going to talk about baseball, but as a parallel, baseball was originally two words. Uh, in, in the 1860s, it was, it was almost always two words. Uh, gradually, people started to hyphenate it. Um, eventually, some condensed it into one word, and there was at no point uh, one moment where, where there was an edict from above saying, it's, it's one word now, everybody, stop hyphenating, one word. And I think almanacs are, are probably the same kind of phenomenon that people realize, well, you don't really need the extra K because right. the C, that's one less, uh, one less letter. But th there might be a better reason for it. I don't, I don't know. Does the old farmer's almanac still use the K? They okay, yeah, early early nineteenth century. I mean, it, it, it's um, I think that's one more feature that that might make people dismiss the almanacs is because they use this funny archaic spelling with the K at the end, and it looks odd to our uh, to our modern eye for sure. Any other questions? All right, going once, going twice. Thank you.